Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Daily Gold podcast. This is being recorded on Thursday, July 11, 2024. Uh, great day for gold and the precious metals markets. Uh, but for you guys, I have another company interview for you. And with me today, he is the CEO of Liberty Gold, Cal Everett. And Cal, let's get right into it. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the company, maybe you can first state your current market cap, cash position, and then just a brief introduction of Liberty Gold for those who are unaware. Oh, okay. Um the current market cap of the company is about 130, 140 million uh, uh, dollars Canadian. Uh, we raised uh, 12 and a half million uh, Canadian at 35 cents with some of our biggest shareholders. And that was done with no fees payable. So we saved seven, 800 grand in fees at no discount to market. And there was a half a warrant on that at uh, 40, I think it was 45 cents uh, for two years. And then, uh, we announced the uh, pending sale of the TV tower project in Turkey for 11.5 million US. And that's waiting for the government signature on it. It's on the government's desk right now. Once they sign off on that, then um, our COO will fly to Turkey and, um, and sign off on the changes of directors there, which is a requirement under Turkish law. And then we would get uh, over a, a 24 month period, 70, approximately 72% of the 11.5 million US uh, goes into our treasury. And again, no fees, no dilution. And then we've got all that money in the treasury uh, and we're just starting to spend uh, money again. And we've got uh, two drills operating at Black Pine, drilling on uh, seven new targets. And um, I get the visuals every night. I'm not going to comment on the visuals. What we're looking for is just more ounces, as, as we talked about a few minutes ago. And for those who don't understand um, these big Carlin-type systems, they're sedimentary host, hosted, structurally controlled, all oxide gold system. Okay. Side of active hours. Okay. One second. And... Um, they, so you got to find follow structure. And then when you find the core feeder structures, then you drill them off. And that's where you find your high grade. And outside of those high grade zones, then you're looking at um, uh, a lower grade halo to it. And it really depends on the gold price whenever you do any economic study, what your cutoff grade is. Okay. It's a, it's like you could go put out an economic study on anything in the Great Basin right now. And if the gold price goes to say $2,600 an ounce, your cutoff grade might get lower and your, uh, your IRS can go higher and your price assumptions all change. Okay, so this, it's, a, it's an earth moving operation once you've got a big one like, like Black Pine. Okay, now staying with Black Pine, um, you mentioned economics. So let, let's, let's touch on that. I, I know you guys are, are doing a pre-feasibility study. Uh, approximately when will you guys release that to the market? And then just, is there any information you can tell us about, you know, what potential size you're looking at? Um, you know, how capital costs are are looking, you know, what ASIC yeah, you're targeting? Is there anything you can tell us publicly? Uh, that, that's about as much inside information as one man can ask in one, in one question. It was pretty funny, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but but kudos for you for trying. Uh, the reality is it's probably two, three months away because when you're dealing with nine different uh, metallurgical engineering groups, uh, uh, mine plant builders, uh, power supplies, all that kind of stuff, it really depends how you're, then that affects your CapEx, okay? And then you've got to go look at your royalties and then you have to figure out the state of Idaho taxation system. This all takes time, right? And so... It, it, it's 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 a moving scenario. So you might get, okay, we've got that down and that's the a realistic cost without being overly optimistic because using optimistic uh, costs from one engineering firm is not necessarily the best thing any mining company can do, okay? And, but I would tell you that at $3,000 gold, and it's not $3,000 gold, this thing is going to pour money. And, and, and it's gonna, literally, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's going to pour money because the fact is you're moving, let's say half gram material and a gram of gold today is probably 85, 90 bucks a gram. I think something like that. 
And so if you're running a half gram, you've got $45 a rock feed. You know, but gosh, to say, I'm making up a number here, $12 US to mine it, move it, stack it, process it, GNA, uh, sustaining capital. The difference is your profit margin. And if you got 150 million tons of that or 50 million tons of it, that's all profit. You're getting into the billions. Okay. And that's how you have to look at these. So if you wanted to do a comparison of operating mines, Round Mountain and Bald Mountain of Kinross and Marigold for SSR, those are big earth moving operations. And uh, you'll find, I think, in the end that you're going to be looking at pretty much the same metallurgy. Right, the same kind of recoveries on all of them are, are the same. The only difference is round and boulder. They're, they're, that's pretty much at the end of their mine life in 27, 29. And they're going underground on that for higher grade material. And so all mines change. But if you go back to Marigold, which is a really well-run operation by SSR, um, they're, they, get their, they make a lot of their money on their ability to use huge trucks and huge shovels in order to get the cost to, to blast and move a ton down to industry, you know, standards where it was virtually impossible for some companies to do. They just figured it out. And that mine, I think, has been operating for over 30 years, and they, and they just keep finding more gold and finding more gold. With B Black Pine, there's only a, we call them a royalty burden because they're a burden on your cash flow, right? So... We got a royalty burden on the entire project of around a half a point, 0.5%. It's just under 10% at Marigold. Okay, so that's how much they're making money, tons of money on it. But at the same time, you got to give up 9%, 10% of your of your uh, of your production to different groups, right? And I think Franco has a piece of that. Uh, two U.S. universities have pieces of that, and a couple other institutions have pieces of, of whatever that royalty adds up to. But they've published some really good um, uh, 43 101 reports. If anybody wants to understand Earth moving, go into the latest 43 101 report by SSR on just the Marigold mine. It's a classic, right? And so, how many tons per day is that operating? Can't remember, but it's big. Right. So we'd be looking at, uh, uh, let's say, as low as a 0.1 gram cutoff to 0.2 to 0.3, 0.35, trying to find out your optimal production. Right. So if your cutoff grade goes higher, the greater your deposit goes higher. OK. And if the greater your deposit goes higher, the metallurgic recovery is higher. That's the way it works. And if you go all the way down to Marigold, I think is like 0 0.065 grams is the cutoff grade that your recoveries down there are going to be lower than they are at, at, at uh, say, a 0.3 gram cutoff, right? But as long as they can go take a ton for X dollars and leach it and get $1 out of it, even if they went and lost eight bucks a ton, they're getting cash flow back instead of putting it into a waste dump, right? So it, it's, the, it's how these things are mined. It's, 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 it's Sounds complicated, but it actually isn't all that complicated in, when, when you understand them. So given that it looks like we're going into a bull market for gold, or we're already in one, yeah, um, I agree. Does, that, does that mean for you guys that you could you could be looking at a 50,000 ton per day or 80,000 or 60,000 ton per day versus like a smaller high grade, you know, 20,000 tons per day? Well, this is a, now you're getting into mine life. Okay. So you don't want to go build a mine for X dollars. And then you got to figure out how do I get my money back in the first, say, three years? Right. But if you've only got a six year mine life, you're going to want a smaller mine because you got to clean it up or run uh, 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 lower grade stockpiles for the next three or four years of your operation. So you're trying to scale it out over 10 years. And then you want to look at what your numbers are. You're going to be producing, I'm, I'm just making up numbers, 100, 125, 150, 175, 1,000 ounces a year. It really depends, right? And, and as soon as you get access to your highest grade material, that's the stuff that recovers up in the 80%. And there's 2 million ounces spread over this property of just high grade at a gram. That's $90 rock. That's, that's the margin rock you want to get into. 
But in the beginning, if you have to pre-strip it, you might in the first year be getting uh, lower production. But by the time you get into the end of year two, year three, you're pouring money, right? And that all has to go into the thinking of all the different engineering groups. In terms of exploration, I mean, you already have three and a half million ounces of black pine. Um, is yeah. there, I mean, I guess a two-part question. First, uh, what's the potential to grow that past four million ounces? And then secondly, can those extra ounces add even more value to the project and the NPV? The answer is there's easily potential to go to four. Okay. Easily potential, we think, to go through five and make it a tier one deposit. Question is, what's the grade of those ounces and how close are they to surface? Can you get at them or do you have to wait for later in a mine life to get access to them? Right? Because you don't want to be pre-stripping for just to get at, at a half a million ounces, right? You don't want to do that. And that's where the engineers get involved, and that's above my pay pay grade. I don't, I'm not the, the brainiac who can figure out how to do that. My job is uh, the job of a CEO is effectively one thing, money and market cap. Anything to do with money. And then the president, his job is operations and the COO looks at the balance sheet and then, you know, and then you handle all the questions from the board and, and you just keep operating like a, like a nice, uh, well-run company. Uh, so how th that potential to get to 5 million ounces, I, I mean, can you do that with the current drill program or is that something that would take a couple of years? If I really lowered the cutoff grade, I could do that tomorrow. Okay, because all the ounces that you're not putting in, uh, just lower the cutoff grade and it brings in all that low grade stuff. But if gold is $3,000 an ounce, pretty much everything on that mountain is going to get the heat leached. Everything. Doesn't make any difference if it's, if it's a fraction of something. There's, there's cash flow in it. And you just don't know because you, you have no crystal ball uh, or would I as to what the ultimate gold price is going to be. But when you get days late today and you see the gold price leap by $50 and you can see, and I'm not overly sure all of the reasons for that personally, uh, part of it is the US dollar, part of it is lowering interest rates, part of it is a lack of physical supply in the world of people who want it. Uh, part of it are central governments who are looking to build up their gold inventories right, as a, as a hedge on, on, against the U.S. dollar. Um, and then you've got the physical exchange in Shanghai that's looking for product, and they, they, they got to get the physical, right? I, I think ultimately the uh, London Metal Exchange and probably Chicago, which deals with paper gold, they could, they could sell me a contract for 100,000 ounces right now at some price, and then they don't deliver it, and they just settle with the difference of whether I made money or lost money on uh, and just cancel it to try the thing. Just send me cash. That's not what I want. I want the physical. Right? I always thought when I die, I should have a gold, a gold, uh, uh, solid gold uh, coffin to lay me down into, into my ultimate dream. <laughs> <laughs> but then you wouldn't be able to see that and really experience it <laughs> well i well you know i'm getting my cataracts done in a couple months so if i could just stay alive long enough to look up the hole and see how good i did <laughs> sorry as you know i've got a dark sense of you <laughs> oh. oh that's a uh, perfectly welcome on this show um <laughs> so 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 for black pine you you can you can't even if i ask you two or three times you can't give me any well, let me ask you this. So, because you mentioned t getting to 5 million ounces, that's a tier one project. What production per year is that? Is that 250,000 ounces a year? Is that 300,000? No, I, 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 I don't think it would go up to that. Some years, yeah. It depends when you, where you're hitting in the, in the, in the, in the, where you're mining in that entire mountainside. Uh, but you're, you're trying to spread it out over time because you don't want to use it, take in all your high grade out front and then do low grade for the rest of it. Then you really have to be hoping for a gold price that gives you margins the further out you go. You're trying to extend the mine life. And let's say you've had, I'm just making up a number, 10 year mine life. After year one, you got nine years left, but all, every mine operates the same way. They just keep drilling out of cash flow to replace that one year. And if they replace it by th three years and they go back out to 12, that's when you see mines, mine expansions happen. 
right? Because there's a rule of thumb in the industry. Every 10 years, you got to replace all of your equipment um, and things like that. And um, you got to replace it all. And you got to, and one of the biggest costs are the biggest costs are generally diesel, truck tires, salaries when you're operating one of these things. And people say, what do you mean truck tires? Cost a lot of money for rubber. So if you have a really dirty, if those it, are some it, big ass tires too on those trucks. Oh yeah, they can go for fifty thousand, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a tire. Okay, and if you and if you don't make your road easy to drive on with your with a fully loaded truck, you're going to rip the crap out of your tires. So you've got to you've got to kind of get that everything done to a point where you save on your wear and tear. Right, so. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting business, but um, and and so we try to move forward on the uh, permitting approach on black pine as fast as we can. Uh, we've done deliverables, and and when we selected that project, we selected for a reason. There's no community, there's no trees, there's no water, there's no fish, there's no endangered species, and there is power to the mine gate that does not need to be upgraded. Okay, and. We secured our water rights, I'm going to say three years ago, for twice the size of a normal operation. We've got that surplus. But I, you asked a little bit about Gold Strike. Gold Strike, we're just working on water there now, right? Because if you get into that part of Utah and you get into the town of St. of St. George, it's just golf course after golf course after golf course. And they're using up the water supply. So... You got you got to get access to your water. That's it. Because some great deposits may never be mined if you're not close to a water source. So how is that going down there? Oh, it's a process. We deal with the government. We'll be meeting them, I think, next week or the week after. You know, go talk to the government. And you go to the government wants the jobs and they want the infrastructure paid for. And then you then they want to get revenue out of it. And it, it, and there are all the roads there are government uh, operated. So I don't have to blade them or anything like that to keep potholes out of them. The government cleans it up. Right? Right. And for, ga for game on that property, all you're going to see is deer and cattle grazing randomly from farmers. Just, you know, there's there's some ponds in the area where they'll drink water. And occasionally we'll see a cougar going through. That's about it. So, um, what's the status of the land exchange? Is that going to happen or? Well, it's, it's in front of the U.S. government and uh, they took it off of this year's um, uh, uh, studies. Because I, I think with the pending U.S. election, um, they don't want anything to interfere. Right. And make, make something become a political issue. Right. And we don't know, like one of the things we're actually waiting to see if they can actually pull it off by the end of this year is Perpetua getting their mine permit at the old Midas mine. If they get that, Idaho's in play and there's going to be a stinking rush. Right. Because that's going to be a big mine. And I don't know what the build cost is going to be, but I'd be guessing two billion maybe to build it. So that's really key here. And that mine is scheduled for, I think, a 10-year mine life at uh, I think 400,000 ounces of gold a year, if I, I might be wrong, and 5,000 tons of, uh, of antimony. Right. So, so but what would that mean for gold strike? Because we were talking about gold strike and, and uh, a moment ago. Well, it doesn't really mean anything for gold strike because I need the water. Right? And then once I've got the water that is secured by lease or with the government's, assistance then i just go go from there and I, we go take another look at it because a massive portion of gold strike's never been drilled on strike and uh, it goes to the east northeast there's jasperoids going for a couple kilometers down the road that haven't got a drill hole in it but yet they're full of antimony and there's gold grades in there as well and then it goes down a slope down into a flat agricultural valley right towards a uh um, a natural gas plant on, on a four lane island, right? So all that stuff gets factored in later. 
but I don't go spend a fortune on it. Black pine is too important. It's too big, right? And it doesn't mean that we're not looking for new acquisitions. Like our, our guys will go out, look at everything we can find and just say, well, can we get this and add that to the company? Whether I drill it or not this year is not relevant. It's it's how many ounces do we think are there? And that does that take us up to, say, 7 million ounces aggregate? And then can you see room to go up to 10? And then you become the number one oxide gold player in the Great Basin. Yeah, I've always got an agenda. Got you thinking now. <laughs> I think, thinking of a follow up. Um, now back to black. <laughs> back to black pine. Um, what is what gives you the most NPV? Is that having a a ten year mine life, a twelve year mine life, or fifteen year mine life? I, I don't know which way they're going to go on this one because I'm not personally a big NPV fan, right? Because I think it's just a bunch of mathematical formulas that justify the paychecks to mining analysts. You, you know what I mean? It's it's like, I don't really pay attention to that. Can you make money on the rocks or can't you make money, right? And what's your return and how fast does the money come back in? That's really all I focus on. I just dumb it down. And uh, so, I mean, obviously you want the highest NPV you can get. But what does it really mean? You, you know, in the end of the day, what does it mean? Could be a high NPV, but the but the rock is too low grade to mine. I don't. Know. So, but sorry I mean for the... sorry for answering a question that I really don't even pay attention to on it when it comes to NPVs. I just don't. Okay, well, well, let me ask you this. I mean, let's think of another metric. I mean, the ASIC. What kind of all in costs? I mean, is there any kind of a range that we're looking at for black pine? Is there any way you can have a low cost? Is it, you know, the gold price is going up. So does that mean that ASIC kind of, it's less important to have that super low cost scenario? With, within inflation, your ASIC always goes up. Okay. It has to. And so it, it, it could be coming in at 1250, but if you're operating a gold mine in Turkey, as an example, using Turkish manufacturers tur and Turkish ore trucks are like 20, 40 ton trucks and they're all white Mercedes trucks made in country. And with the labor there and the costs involved, then you get yourself into a scenario where it, you might be down at 800 and it just pours cash, right? Just pours it. And as you know, there was a couple of uh, heat leach failures around the world. Um, the, the, and in my history, I've, I've just, they all happened this year, right? And when I, I don't comment about the companies or what they're doing, but generally when I see stuff like this happen, it doesn't matter if it's a hard rock mine at Grassberg and the pit wall collapses or something like that. It always comes down in, in some way to operations and engineering, a combination of both. And then all of a sudden, you know, you never know what the, what the, the company are doing in terms of we need more cash flow. And then people have this tendency just to better get them some tons. And sometimes there's too much pressure put on some of the guys and they, they might just miss something or, or, and that's why you have these things. I mean, look at the, uh, the old mine Montana tunnels. It's long since shut down. And um, the guys who owned it, I forget their names. They came into my office when I was in the sell side. And they were talking about, because the share price was was wiped out, and they're saying, uh, I, so I just said, um, what's it going to cost to clean up that mess? And the response to me, and I'll never forget it, is we call it a naturally generated pre-stripping program. You figure those words out. No. The mine's not in production anymore. But how would you ever come up with that and try to make a, a pit wall failure into something positive? Right? And, and, and you got some young guy in the room, and the room's fully uh, sell side brokers, and they're nodding their heads down and they're writing notes. And I'm going, I'm out of here. I just got out of the meeting and walked out. I mean, it's just ludicrous. Right, so you, you see it, and then you see what Valley had to do. I think it was in Brazil on a on a tailings dam failure, and the one tailings dam failure in um, in BC, uh, I think three or four years ago, or something like that, and how it affects people. 
right? And so the the management of, of the companies that had issues this year, I like them all. They're really smart guys, right? But some things, sometimes stuff happens and you've, you've got to fix it. That's it, right? So do I think both mines will come back into production? Uh, yeah, I do. I think once... Um, uh, SSR gets their site cleaned up, then there'll be buyers for their debt on that project and there'll be, um, and someone will want it, right? Because it's still a good mine. They just got to rebuild a new heat leach pad. And I don't know what the people from, uh, from uh, at the Eagle Mine in the Yukon are going to do because they're still in that evaluation phase and they're not going to say anything until, until they can say something, right? Coming out with a premature comment is dangerous in this business. Yeah, and that's why you're uh, not not giving me too many premature comments on these questions. <laughs> yeah, because because I don't know the answers yet. Because they 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 and our guys keep me in the dark on it. They do because I don't want to be privy to those numbers. When you guys are done and you figured out your optimum scenario, put it in front of me and then black me out, and then I'll throw, you know, questions at it. Did you try this? Did you try that? Did you try this? Because all you're trying to do is make it better, not make it worse. Uh, okay, so wrapping things up, Cal, do you want to uh, comment on anything that we didn't cover or give a, you know some final words about the company and, and why investors should look to Liberty Gold and uh, not one of the other hundreds of junior mining companies out there? Well... Um, I'm going to say on an industry basis, the developers have been in the doghouse for a while. Um, basically, because if your market cap's 30 million, you got to raise 300 million. The sell side bankers are going to say, he's got to raise 10 times his market cap. Not going to happen. Right. So you have to have the ability to analyze that. So what do I do? I, I, I meet the debtors already a few years in advance just to see what kind of terms they have. Right. And then you do that because that goes into your project economics ultimately. Because you might be doing 50 50 debt equity, or you might be doing 30% equity and the rest debt, or you might be doing all equity depending on your share price. And a really well run company um, in Brazil is G Mining. They've done it perfectly. Right. They're on time, ahead of schedule, and under budget, and they ranged their debt and secured it. And then they are, they, are, they got approval, I think, uh, yesterday or the day before to take over Reunion Gold, and that gives them a pipeline. Okay? That was a good move by that company. Okay? And you look at the share price on it. It's outperformed in the entire space. But I go talk to mutual funds. Some of them have money. Some of them are still seeing redemptions, even at, say, 1200 and or sorry, uh, uh, at the current gold price, like 24.20. Because people will trade these funds in order to take a little bit of cash off the table. They can put money in, they can take money out. And that's to the detriment of the, of the fund manager because they, they always like to be fully invested. Okay, so it's, it's and then if, for them to go buy something new, they might have to go sell another com company. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's it's a fascinating time, and there's not a lot of places in the Great Basin that are good deposits. I think, uh, and you know, in Canada and, and the U.S., come right back to what I said about seven years ago was this is the jurisdiction where you want to be because you want to be in a place that's got stable uh, tax laws for protection of your after-tax free cash flow. Yeah. So. Like you look at Finland, some people like there. Uh, Australia has been well picked over. New Zealand's starting to get a good look at it. Uh, Europe, it's tough, right? It's tough. Um, and uh, some countries like England, Ireland, they're not the best exploration place, but they're probably better for Beishi uh, type lead zinc deposits if you go to Sweden things and, and Norway, that kind of stuff. Because deposits tend to cluster age group per location in the world. That's what they tend to do. 
So I guess last question. So being in the U S in the great basin, do you think that ultimately will give you a lot more value for the ounces that you have in addition to the economics? Like there's a a jurisdictional premium that you get being Mm -hmm. in the great basin. Yeah, you do get that premium and it's starting to come back, but right now you're in the summer doldrums and I'm still seeing, I don't care what company it is. Some people using it uh, like a 4% rise in their share price. And someone will say, oh, there's liquidity. I better take some money off the table. That's human nature, right? You can't be upset by that at all. Can't. And uh, so it's just liquidity in a public market. And the big funds like liquidity. They don't like a stock that's just so tight that if they want to go to the market and buy 5 million shares, they'd move the market cap up by 50% trying to get that block of stock. It's tough. Right. So they walk away from the transaction because it's not worth their while. So, and when it comes to the gold price, probably to finish off this call, do I think it's going higher? Yeah, a lot. Um, and I just think everything is going to have its time and its place. And the real run in this market will probably start for, for the sector that I work in. I'm going to say the last two weeks of August going into September, October, November is seasonally good for this business. And the sell side guys, and I know them all, uh, they're running the product because there's not a lot of good ones out there. Right. And, you know, doing five cent financings for companies with a one million dollar market cap with a full warrant at 10 cents is not doing the company any favors, but they need to survive. So. That help you? Yeah. Well, Cal, on that note, thank you so much for coming on today. And I uh, hope we can do this again later this yeah, year and maybe get some hard, yeah. more uh, hard numbers for the PFS. Oh, yeah. And if I if, and and I got no problem giving them to you if they're out. <laughs> well, I very <laughs> much look I very much look forward to that. Yeah. And, yeah. and last thing, yeah. Cal, if if uh, listeners, they want to get more information on Liberty Gold, where should they go? go? Who should they uh, contact? I'll get a hold of Miss Susie Bell. You know Susie. And uh, she's head of IR, IR, and it's all on our website, how to contact her, and the PowerPoint presentations are there. But that's going to get changed here. Okay? We're going to update things and working on that at the same time. Give it a better, give it a fresher look. Okay, Cal. Thank you so much for coming on, and I, I look forward to that next call. Okay. So do I. You take care. <laughs>